All right, so good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about the Scopes Monkey Trial. They called it the Monkey Trial. Um, this happened 95 years ago. So it's a nice, even number. We're almost to the 100th anniversary. It happened in 1925. And I'd like to look back to see the culture of the time in 1925, uh, see what the debate was about. It's evolution versus creation. And then we'll look to see what's changed since then on both sides. You think about 1925. Uh, if you go back in your history, uh, there's a lot of things that have, that have happened since then. All of the technology and so on. And all of uh, advances in theology as well. So we'll look at both sides of the argument and see what's changed since then. And then we'll conclude by looking at some of the things that haven't changed. So, so this is sort of the, if you've heard the phrase, the elephant in the room, you know, anytime you talk about a topic like science and religion, you know there's going to be an elephant in the room. Okay, and this is kind of a funny cartoon. So the guy, the elephant's on the witness stand, and he says, "You're telling me you're in the middle of the room and nobody saw you." <laughs> okay. So the elephant in the room is the topic that everybody knows you need to address and you need to talk about, but nobody talks about it. Okay, you go on talking about all the other things, and I'm sure you and your friends, y'all have elephants in the room that you just don't go there to keep the peace. Okay. Well, in this course, we have two elephants in the room. Anytime you're talking about science and religion, you're talking about the clashes in science and religion, and you have an elephant in the room of evolution and an elephant in the room of creation. And you can talk about all these other topics, but if you don't address these, everybody knows you're avoiding the two biggest parts of this topic in people's minds. And in fact, that was what um, uh, Dr. Kaminska, her husband said, why are we teaching another class on evolution versus creation? You know, that's, he immediately knew those are the two elephants in the room. Okay, and so today's the day we're really going to talk about this clash. And believe it, it's deeper than you thought. Okay, so hopefully that's a, a good uh, teaser for you to pay attention. The reason we don't go there very often is this is a short list of the lawsuits. <laughs> that have happened on this topic. So this is an area where people love to sue each other. Okay, uh, Whether there's merits or not, we'll see why it doesn't matter if there's merits to the lawsuit or not. Okay, and Most of the time you think if you're getting sued you must have done something wrong. Right? But that's not always the way it works. Okay, and We'll look today at uh, way, the way the system works in terms of, of lawsuits and free speech and constitutional matters. Now a lot of times there is a wrong that's done in like a civil lawsuit or something. You owe me money and you won't pay and you won't answer my phone calls so then I'll take you to court. I'll sue you to try to get my money back. You've damaged my property or something like that. So it's not the only way it works but for, for free speech, establishment clause, second amendment, all these kinds of constitutional issues, uh, there's a way that the legal system interacts with the legislative system. So we'll talk about that today. So the Scopes monkey trial, in quotes, that's what started it all in terms of this creation evolution war, if you want to call it that. So in 1925, Tennessee passed a law forbidding the teaching of human, monkey to man, evolution in public schools. This was called the Butler Act. Okay? And it was a big push to get something on the books that, that prevented this. Okay? And we'll talk about what culture was like at that time period so that we can understand where this law came from and why it came about. And then immediately the American Civil Liberties Union, we've heard of the ACLU probably, uh, they got together with the city of Dayton or the city of Dayton contacted them and local businessmen and they got together and they asked coach John Scopes to help challenge the law. So do you see, this is already hinting that this is an interesting way to go about things. They're trying to find somebody to help them challenge the law. Okay. It was actually interesting. It wasn't just a constitutional issue, the ACLU getting involved, but notice the involvement of businessmen in the city of Dayton. What was this going to be? This was going to be the biggest event in Tennessee and, and all across the nation, this battle between creation and evolution, between atheists and Christians. And the city of Dayton said our hotels are going to be full and our restaurants are going to be full and it's going to bring a lot of people to Dayton. 
so they're going to make a lot of money off of this. And this is not a pejorative thing. They said, hey, we're in, in the business to, to make money. This is a great way to bring people to Dayton. Okay, let's have this lawsuit here. It's going to be someplace in Tennessee. Let's have it here. And so this is uh, the book that I'm getting this material from, Summer for the Gods. It's an analysis of the Scopes trial and, and America's debate on science and religion. And he won the Pulitzer Prize for pulling all of the historical facts together and, and interviewing the people that, that uh, remember at least some of the characters. Uh, so I think he deals fairly with the religious and the non-religious motivations on both sides. Okay. There's a movie and a play written called Inherit the Wind that's about this trial. And it's very... Um, like whenever you try to make a movie, you make composite characters and you add in a love interest and you put in a lot of, you know, entertaining figures, they weren't really historical. So Larson's book really sticks with the history of the matter and the Inherit the Wind is more theatrical and, and, and takes some artistic license with the facts. Like there was no love interest, the Scopes wasn't arrested in class in front of his students or anything like that. This was set up to be a free speech issue and they recruited him as a defendant and then uh, the um, and then he was charged with breaking the law. Okay, so so who were the players? Let's go back to, to 1925 and in fact let's go back even further. So what is this about? I mean this is a religious issue so we're gonna go all the way back. God, <laughs> okay, and Moses and the book of Genesis which was written somewhere as unclear exactly when that, that, that material was written down, but somewhere in the late Bronze Age, so 1550 to 1200 BC. Okay, And that, those writings are part of the first five books of the Bible, also called the Torah, and then other prophet, prophetic writings and then the New Testament combined to give the Bible that they were reading in 1925 and that we read today. Okay, So they had copies of the book of Genesis and that's what they were going on. So God, Moses, these were players in this, in this drama of the Scopes trial. In 1859, Charles Darwin publishes his book on the origin of the species. How many have heard of that one? Everybody, right? And so this is talking about the descent of man and the origin of species and basically common descent that, that all the biodiversity in, on planet Earth is coming from an original ancestor. And so you just have descent with modification, and we'll get into what evolution means here in a minute. Okay. So Charles Darwin was uh, a huge player in this. And then this idea of natural selection acting on these random mutations, which they didn't really have the word mutation yet because they didn't know about DNA. So that's one of the things that's changed. They just knew that traits were hereditary and that your children had slight variations on your traits. Okay, And that nature could act on those variations. And you might have heard the phrase survival of the fittest. Now we think of fit as being able to bench press a lot or run fast, but that's not what it means. It means fitting the environment. So whatever that organism is, is fits into the environment best is going to survive. And like today, if you were very intolerant of the cold, like if you just passed out whenever you got cold, then you would not fit this environment very well. And so that's what we mean by the fittest, survival of the fittest. But this phrase, survival of the fittest, was used by some of the, um, the entrepreneurs of the day, like Carnegie and Rockefeller, to talk about their business practices. And so that's kind of showing you how uh, the ideas of Darwin permeated society in, in just you know, 40 short years. They were already making their way into, in the 1900s, the business practices of uh, Carnegie and Rockefeller. Also, the first human fossils were unearthed as early as 1909. So that's actually not very early compared to the 1925 trial. And it turned out the very first one, the Piltdown Man, was a hoax. And so you can find there's a link at the very end of this PowerPoint, uh, a description of how that was a hoax. They had a, a partial a skeletal jaw and a skull and they put them together they didn't actually go together um, and they filed down the teeth to make them look more human like 
And so you can look at the details on that. They still don't know who did the hoax, but they know that it was modified to make it look more human-like. But anyway, from 1909 to the present, the fossil record has changed dramatically. Some other things that flowed out of this Darwinian thinking. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Darwin was a proponent of these things. These are people using Darwin's theory to do these things. So they're taking the philosophical thinking that, that fits within the Darwinian theory and they're, they're letting those dominoes fall. And some may be helping them fall in the direction that they want them to go. So this is one of the most controversial outgrowths of Darwinian thinking and that's called eugenics. Okay. So Hunter and Galton really pushed this, this science of eugenics where they would force the sterilization of the mentally ill and in their term the retarded and the habitual criminals and they would uh, even do that to epileptics because they thought that was some sort of hereditary uh, issue. So you think about that, that's forced sterilization, that's dramatic, okay. Uh, that of course, that wasn't really, you know, that was growing all the way up through 1935. In fact, the, the eugenics that we sort of criticized the Nazis for practicing, and Dr. Mengele, um, he was upset that the Americans were ahead of him in eugenics. So we had it here in this country in, in, in large measure. Not only that, but the different races. They looked at Darwin's theory and they said, ah, the different races may be different branches on this, this tree of life and so some races are preferred to others and we see that also in the, in the thinking against the Jews with the Nazis. And so trying to purify the race and so this also led to forbidden intermarriage and so they would say races can't intermarry because of the gene pool and this thinking from, from Darwinian thinking. So these are some dominoes that fell from the philosophy of Darwin. So this is again, who are the players? These are the players that are setting up the, the sort of the Darwinian side of this battle. Friedrich Nietzsche, who is a philosopher who's, um, whose philosophy is called nihilism or nothingism, if you think about the role that God played in creation in the thinking of that day and in the 1800s, God was sovereign and he was creator and he is the one that made all of the different types of plants and animals and humans and so on and that the meaning for all of those objects and how they fit into creation was their relationship with their creator. If it was all random modifications and natural selection, then God's not necessary. Okay? If you lose God, you lose meaning and morality. And so Nietzsche was showing that if God is dead, then we have no horizon, we have no compass. And he was okay with that. He was saying, look, this is nihilism. There's, there's, no, there's no compass. What we thought was a compass was false because Darwin is true. And so essentially there's no compass. There's no moral compass. There's no compass on our behaviors and actions and no purpose either. So this is a very depressing theory. And I've given you a snapshot of it. There's, there's more nuance to it, of course. But this nihilism led to these criticisms and also was seen as being... Uh, a source of the justification for these wars. If there's really no value to humans, if we're no different than cockroaches or any other kind of living creature, then there's really no problem sending 40 million of them to die in a war for your national interests. Okay. So if you lose the value of humanity, then a whole lot of other things are permissible. And this is what this criticism of, of Nietzsche uh, from William Jennings Bryan, which is a character in, the, in, this, uh, in this whole series of events, he, cr he criticized Nietzsche. He said, he carried Darwinism to its logical conclusion and denied the existence of God. He denounced Christianity uh, as the doctrine of the degenerate. So what did Nietzsche mean by that? He was saying that Christianity was really a doctrine for the weak, because what are we doing when we take care of the weak in our society? We're actually propping them up when they should be removed from the gene pool. If we want humanity to be as strong as it can be, then the weak should go. And that was what he was saying Nietzsche's philosophy led to. Uh, uh, he said that also it, it overthrew standards of morality and praised war as, a nece as necessary to man's development. So 
This is uh, William Jennings Bryan sort of analyzing Nietzsche. Now, the reason I use Bryan's quote about Nietzsche is that sets up this battle. Whether or not Nietzsche really believed that, Bryan believed that Nietzsche believed that. And Bryan believed that Dar from Darwin through Nietzsche to World War I, that's where we are in 1925. World War I ended in 1919. Okay. So let's look at some of the other players. So on the God side, I've done these in orange. Okay, we have Christians of various stripes. Okay, we have Christian modernists here who around 1854 started to look at the Bible and say, you know, it's got a lot of things in here that we're not so sure about. Uh, like miracles, okay, like uh, virgin births, like, um, uh, you know, the sun stopping for most of a day during a battle in Joshua. And so the modernists were looking at the Bible and reinterpreting these passages and saying, maybe this is allegorical. Maybe this is, you know, um, you know, not meaning an actual virgin birth or not meaning that the sun actually stood still. And so you see how they're sort of breaking with the tradition of, of uh, interpretation and saying maybe there's another way to think of these things. And so that would be the Christian modernists. Uh, this higher criticism in quotes is what I'm talking about where you take the Bible and you look at events and you look at cultures and you try to find another way to, to interpret those passages. Okay. Well, this set up a, a war within Christianity. So we can't understand Christians' opposition to evolution without also understanding Christians' opposition to the modernists within their own camp. Okay. In the middle, you had the Christian holiness movement. Around 1906, we started to see um, experiences in Methodism. We see the rise of Pentecostalism. Um, uh, more emphasis on experience rather than knowledge. So instead of thinking about the Bible and exegetical Bible study, it was more about experiencing the fruits of the Spirit and experiencing, the, that's why they called it the holiness movement. There was a movement in their minds of God in Christianity at the time, a lot of revivals. And so a lot of your denominations, like Assembly of God, um, the uh, uh, Methodism, a branch, a piece of Methodism, um, really blew up around 1909, just before World War I. And then you have the Christian fundamentalist movement. And, and I say Christian fundamentals, because the uh, fundamentalist was added later like the, as a word to describe these people. But at the beginning, it was saying, all right, we have the modernists over here. What do we say? You know, as Christians, what are the fundamentals of our faith? And so they started a journal called the Christian Fundamentals in 1905. And so then you can look at uh, these theologians talking about, you know, where do we draw the line? You know, we have a diversity of opinions on some Bible verses, that's fine. But where do we draw the line? Like, what are the fundamentals? If I was going to say, okay, you, you and I are both Christians and we both believe the same things, what are those main things? Because the main things ought to be the main things and we ought to be charitable about the non-main things. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that would be the, the Christian fundamentals movement, and that focused on right belief. And so if we agree on these things, these are the right things to believe if you're going to call yourself a Christian, and then those things are, are liberal uh, or modernist movements, and, and so you'd be over there uh, with the Christian moder modernists. And there was a big battle, I mean, huge, between the modernists and the, those in the Christian fundamentals movement. So all of that was prior to World War I. Uh, here we come up to after World War I, we see now uh, the evolutionists and the Christian modernists kind of joining together in this. And here we see a, a Christian modernist, Charles Potter. He's a, new, quote, New York Unitarian. So um, again, depending on which group you're in, the Christian fundamentalist would definitely say he's not even a Christian as a Unitarian. Okay? Doesn't believe in the Trinity and thinks everybody's going to heaven. Okay. So you could see how there would be huge divisions between Charles Potter and, say, someone like William Jennings Bryan. And then that's uh, John Scopes on the left. So he was a football coach at Ray County High School. <laughs> and he substitute taught in class whenever they needed him. And so he said, I may or may not have taught human evolution, but I did use the biology book. And the biology book had a chapter in there on how of mankind and a common descent scheme would have come from one of the great apes or 
you know, they didn't have the DNA things to really make it more like a chimpanzee, so they thought it was one of the great apes at the time. And so um, they said, close enough, okay? And so he agreed that, that he would be their defendant. And so then he was, you know, charged for teaching uh, human evolution from, you know, primates, and, and so then this began the trial. So on the, on the uh, prosecution side was William Jennings Bryan. And he was a three-time presidential candidate, if you think about that, and the Secretary of State for Woodrow Wilson. So he's known across the whole, really across the world, he's Secretary of State, but also an incredible orator. He entered Congress in 1930, I mean in his 30s. So he was 30 years old, entered Congress. So think about the youngest Congress people that we have now and how much press they generate and so on. Now think if they had a 30-year career in politics and they ran for president three times, this is who we're talking about. I mean, a superstar, everybody knows this person, and they're coming all the way to Tennessee to prosecute this poor coach for teaching evolution. <laughs> okay. And then on the left was uh, Clarence Darrow, who's uh, also a, a, uh, the most famous lawyer in the country. Uh, he was a union lawyer, and then he had some uh, nationally famous defenses against uh, certain people for murder, so high-profile cases. One of the largest high-profile cases was uh, two high school kids in Chicago, Leopold and Loeb, and they killed a kid in their high school uh, just to see if they could get away with it. This was an unpopular kid, um, he, and they, they were, you know, you know, the popular kids, and they were also talking about how they were uh, sort of up on the scale and Darwinian thinking, and they could just take this kid out and see if they could get away with it. And Clarence Darrow actually used the defense saying that, you know, in a Darwinian scheme, your actions are determined, and they really aren't guilty because they couldn't do any, anything else. I mean, this is, they were determined to do this, okay? And that argument on their behalf was so repugnant to American society that it really had a huge you know backlash against him and that case went national in fact uh, I've got it here uh, yeah Alfred Hitchcock wrote made a movie called Rope and I highly recommend that to kind of get you into the mindset of what they think Leopold and Loeb were doing, okay? And the argument that, uh, that Darrow used to argue for their d defense. And so he really was seen as a, uh, by all, especially the Christian fundamentals, as uh, enemy number one. Okay, so this is an epic battle between the most outspoken proponent for fundamental Christianity and the most outspoken proponent for Darwinian evolution and the psychological ramifications of that. So this was an epic battle. But you really can't understand, I think, the motiva motivation of the, the Christian side of things, right? I mean, why not live and let live? Whether they teach evolution in schools, you know, you can teach your kids the Bible at home. It's really not that big of a deal. I mean, you could make these arguments, right? But what was it about evolution that really made society, Christian society and, and, and others, fear it? Is that a lot of these folks tied evolutionary thinking to World War I, and World War I was a shock on the com conscience of the world. Forty million people died, and a lot of those in the most horrific way, in particular chemical weapons. And so the, these three substances were responsible for most of the weapons injuries. There were three. There was chlorine gas, phosgene, and mustard gas. And phosgene and chlorine gas basically cause you to uh, asphyxiate, but very slowly. I mean, over hours and maybe even over a day. So you get this gas in your lungs and you can't expel it. It's, it's not like just a bad smell. Okay. Because the chlorine gas will react with the lining in your lung tissue and make chlorides, and then that's salt inside your lungs, so salt water inside your lungs. And the way osmotic pressure works is that then your body tries to dilute that salt, so it's pumping water into your lungs and you asphyxiate. Okay. 
Phosgene does something similar, essentially damages the lining of your lungs. And they found out, you know, in World War I, they were like, okay, this is a great way to kill a lot of troops because lungs are your weak link. You breathe something in, I mean, your lungs are very weak. We found that recently with vaping, okay? Again, the toxin is the dose. You get a little whiff of the oil and so on, it's not going to kill you, right? But if these people over vape, what are they doing? It's actually called steam distillation. And whenever you extract oils, like essential oils, where do those come from? They come from plants. How do they get them out of the plants? They grind them up, put them in a little flask, and they run a steam pipe in there. And the steam heats up the oils and carries it over into the collection flask. So the oils come over with the steam. And if you do this enough, the oil coalesces and you get pure oil in the collection flask. And the other thing too is it, it protects the oil because it doesn't overheat the oil. If you were to try to distill it with just heat, the oil would decompose and get nasty. Okay? But steam caps that temperature at 100 degrees C and the oil can handle that temperature. You're doing the same thing with vaping. You're putting that oil in your lungs and if you get enough of it, that oil will coalesce in your lungs and it's very difficult to get that oil out of your lungs. If you get water in your lungs, they can dehydrate you because the lung lining is permeable to water. So the water can come out of your lungs and you can pee it out with a lot of diuretics, okay? And they just dehydrate your body. But with oil, they can't do that. And so that's why we have really severe cases of what they call lipid pneumonia with over vaping. So if you put too much oil in your lungs, it can coalesce and create liquid, uh, lipid ammonia, lipid being the fats and the oils. So this is a bad thing. So when people saw what was going on in World War I, especially with the, with the, uh, the chemical warfare, you know, their conscience was really shocked. And in fact, the worldwide, they signed into the Geneva Protocol uh, adopted by the League of Nations that bans the use of chemical and biological agents. That was in 1925. And now to prove my point that the world was shocked by chemical warfare, this happened in 25, so that really sets the stage for the mental conscience of the world at that time against World War I and specifically against chemical weapons. World War II happens and neither side used chemical agents. <laughs> You think of how bad everybody was in World War II and the, you know, the total warfare and what you had to do to win, and yet still nobody used chemical agents. Okay. So that shows you how bad the, the, the attitudes were against chemical weapons. Yes? Um, thank you, Dr. Williams. Did people use Darwinian theories to justify World War I? Yes, there were some connections that, that this idea of um, like the super race, even though we didn't really have not Nazi socialism at the time, uh, we still had this idea of races pitted against races. So that was present in World War I. But even if it wasn't, the public, at least in the United States, and specifically in Tennessee, believed it was. You see what I'm saying? So they thought Darwinian theory leads to world war and massive death on a global scale. And so it's got to be opposed. So this wasn't about a tiny little interpretation issue. I mean, that's big enough, right? These are people's cherished beliefs. Uh, this was something that had to be stopped. And you better, if I'm the majority, right, you better not be teaching my children that in their schools. So now you can understand the reason the law came about. And it was uh, what we call today populist, like you're trying to appeal to the, pop, uh, appeal to the populism or the popular opinion. Back then they called it majoritarian, so majority rule. And Tennessee was saying, you, you poll the people in this state, we are Christians, and you're teaching them this atheistic theory in our schools, and we're the majority. We're paying our tax dollars for you to teach our children something that goes against our values. And so they weren't having none of that. So that's, that's another motivator too was, hey, we're paying the taxes, these are our schools, and you're putting in these theories that we disagree with. So that was their motivation. And then their justification was, look at where it leads. It leads to things like, like uh, chemical weapons. I, I could have put a lot of gruesome pictures up there. Here's just a, this mustard gas is a blister agent, and you can see the size of the blisters on those hands. I, I didn't want to make people ill. But you look at the pictures of World War I and World War II, naturally you've seen some of those things. If you've ever seen Schindler's List or, or any of the documentaries on the Holocaust, you know what I'm talking about. 
And so if a person's thinking that that's where Darwinian evolution leads, or the teaching of Darwinian evolution leads, you can see why they have a visceral opposition to it. They will not go there, and they will fight it with everything that they have. Okay. So that's sort of the culture that we have in 1925. On the, on the pro-evolution side in the schools, they were saying, this is where the science is leading us, and we're just following science where it goes. They weren't necessarily focused on the philosophical ramifications like eugenics or uh, you know the sterilization and those kinds of things. And so let's talk about this trial. This is how our American system works in terms of constitutional lawsuits. Okay, So there's some issue that people organize for change. So this is related to the 1925 Scopes trial, but it still happens today. This is how we do things today even. So you organize for change, you get a law passed. Oh, and so in the little light, tight, light blue there, it says the Butler Law outlawing, outlawing human education, or human evolution in education, oh, was passed in Tennessee, and it was a misdemeanor with a maximum fine of $500. Okay? So it's not like you're going to go to jail or anything like that, but it was to sort of put a flag you know, in the ground to say this is where we draw the line. But the law's passed, will it pass judicial review? And so that's when the ACLU and several Dayton businessmen approached Coach Scopes to ask if, if he would be their defendant. And he, he agreed to be their defendant. And so then both sides lawyer up. So here we have this tiny little town of Dayton. The courtroom's not even air conditioned. You've got, um, one day they had to hold the trial outside because it was just too hot. <laughs> inside the courtroom and you can see lots of great pictures so let me read these names here these are the the lawyers for uh, for the defense so scopes legal team had Clarence Darrow I told you about the Leopold and Loeb lawyer the the most famous uh, defense lawyer out there Dudley Field uh, John Neal Arthur Garfield Hayes and Frank uh, McElwee so that's five lawyers defending scopes and then in terms of the prosecution it's even more over the top you had uh, Tom Stewart leading the the prosecution team Herbert Hicks Sue Hicks Wallace Haggard Ben and J Gordon McKenzie William Jennings Bryan and his son so we had eight lawyers on the prosecution <laughs> so do you think this is really about someone teaching a lesson on human evolution in a biology classroom. Now this is a constitutional issue and so they bring out the big guns and everybody lawyers up. And you can see that today. You can see whenever there's a constitutional issue the big names come out and they have this epic battle so that we can decide where the boundaries are. And I'm not criticizing it. This is in fact how we preserve things like our free speech. So if you pass a law against free speech and I challenge it you know in a particular case uh, we need to set the boundaries. Okay, um, we have several student groups that do this quite a bit uh, with free speech zones on campus. And so there might be a student group that wants to do a particular uh, event, and the student activities office says, "Well, you really need to do this in the free speech zone because that might be controversial." And so they'll put them over here in a, in a designated free speech zone. And those students will talk to their lawyers and say, we think this is an infringement on our speech. Everybody else gets to do their events right in front of the student center and we're pushed over here to the side because of our viewpoint. And so then they will have a lawsuit about that. And both sides will lawyer up and will say, okay, is this allowed or not allowed? And they analyze how the university decides whether it's a controversial issue or not. That's a real slippery slope in terms of deciding what your event is controversial and yours is not. Who gets to decide that? Okay, there's no list. Okay, and so this is uh, how we still do these things today, and that is using the courts to decide what are the limits and boundaries of these regulations. So, so this is the the lead counsel on both sides, the most vocal ones. But honestly, uh, they wanted it to be just about the evolution law, but really, uh, Williams Jennings Bryant, the head of the Christian fundamentalist movement, really wanted it to be about the Bible. He thought the Bible was going to come out, you know, looking great in this situation. It's going to get the word out about Christian fundamentals, and it's going to show those modernists and those Darwinists where they stand. Okay. Uh, so the trial was diverted quite a bit in its testimony, but in the end, so the, 
it was, it was cast as this atheistic Darwinist side versus the fundamentalist Christian side, and the Bible was on trial, at least in the mind of Brian. Uh, but in terms of the facts of the case, of course, John Scopes was found guilty and fined 200 bucks. <laughs> Uh, they challenged the law a couple more times. They tried to find another, another um, defendant, but they couldn't. And so this law actually stood until 1967. So when the Tennessee legislature repealed it on their own. Okay. So that's pretty amazing. It went from 25, 1925 to 1967. Um, so that's, that's the sort of an overview of the Scopes trial. Uh, it's a fast overview because, again, here's the whole book on it, um, and and I probably covered maybe seven or eight pages. <laughs> okay. Now there is a reading, and we'll talk about the reading uh, this week's reading. It's about it's about seven or eight pages from the book, talking about the trial and some of the the interesting atmosphere around the trial. So, what is the central conflict here? Again, this is the two elephants in the room. Uh, evolution and creation. So let's look at those. And I, I thought this was a funny little picture kind of going with that Darwinian progression up to Darth Vader. So when do we arrive on the scene? That's one of the fundamental questions, right? Uh, when does uh, this Darwinian progression result in what we would call humankind? Okay, that's a, that's a central issue question. And then are we special? Did we just emerge from a long line of primates or are we somehow special? Is there something unique about humanity or are we just higher forms of the primates? And so these are the critical issues in this whole debate between the two. So let's define our terms. Let's look at evolution. So this is from a great website. If you ever want to talk about evolution, or if you're reading a resource on evolution, uh, let's say you're a Christian student and you're reading a book that's talking about evolution and making the case for creation, and they're using a lot of definitions of evolution. I would say, be careful, okay? This is a, this is a, a National Science Foundation funded site at Berkeley to describe evolution. So this is not written by a religious person. If you want to know what an evolutionist thinks evolution means, I would go to this site. You see what I mean? Just to protect yourself from getting fed a straw man. Like even if I were to say something in, in one of my Christian groups, I would say here's the evolutionist view of what evolution means. That's why I'm doing it in this class, rather than giving you my description of what I think evolution means. Because I want to make sure I'm not subject to the biases that we looked at on that Your Bias Is page. Remember that? The confirmation biases and so on. So this is what uh, the evolution page at Berkeley says. Evolution, simply put, is descent with modification. So this encompasses small-scale evolution, which is changes, and of course this is a modern site, so they know about genes. So changes in gene or allele frequency in a population from one generation to the next. And so that's, that's the micro scale. And then also large scale evolution, the de descent of different species from a common ancestor over many generations. This is a very simple and concise definition of what we mean by, by evolution. And then also why they value it, they say evolution helps us to understand the history of life. And so then you've got some great opportunities to learn on this page. Uh, you know, DNA and genes were not known in Darwin's day, so that middle definition was a little bit vague. They knew that uh, her traits were hereditary, like eye color and hair color and shape of the face and height and so on, but they didn't really know the source for those. Why, how is hereditary in acting? Um, they, they, there was a Lamarckian theory that said the necessity uh, drove these inherit, inherited traits. Like, like the giraffe needed a long neck to reach the food in the trees. And so they would say that the need for food caused the necks to grow, rather than the giraffes that happened to randomly have long necks were more survivable. So that would be a Darwinian explanation. The first one was a Lamarckian explanation. And so that's why you'll hear people use this term. This is a new term for you, perhaps. They call it the Neo-Darwinian Synthesis. The Neo-Darwinian Synthesis. So what's the Neo part? That's the gene part. That's the DNA part. 
because Darwin didn't know about DNA. So the neo-Darwinian synthesis is that this, this random, they would say, random mutation in the genes goes into the, the offspring, and so there's genetic drift, okay, and then there's natural selection. And so this is, again, the Evolution 101 page on that same site, and you can work your way through. So even at the evolution site, sometimes uh, um, I've heard Christians say, well, I believe in microevolution, but not macroevolution. And I've heard biologists get upset, who are non-Christian, and say, there is no such thing as microevolution. It's all evolution. Okay, so they didn't like that person splitting it out. But here on the Berkeley site, they talk about the two. They even have microevolution and macroevolution on the Berkeley site. So the microevolution, uh, and up here, you know, looking at the patterns, this is what they had before they had genes was homology. So if you look like, uh, if you look at, at the bones in my arm and look at the bones in a bat and the bones in a monkey, there's, you can identify the same patterns in those bones, okay? And so they're homologous structures. And so they would say, look, that's evidence of a common ancestor. So that was how they built this tree of life using homology. And now with, uh, with genes, they're building up the tree of life using uh, genetic trees. Uh, microevolution would be within a single gene pool. So this would be evolution within a species or within a, a set of mutually reproductive uh, organisms. So uh, that would be within a single gene, gene pool. And everybody, no matter what their view, and, and I got the documentation to back this up, believes in microevolution, even a young earth creationist, because that's how you get the genetic diversity from the flood of Noah to today, is through microevolution. So there's not a view out there that I've ever come across that doesn't accept microevolution. And in fact, that's why we take the full course of our antibiotics. Why? Because the antibiotic, if you take half of it, you've killed off the weak bugs, but maybe there's some super bugs. That, that have been stressed by the first half of your antibiotic course and would die off with the second half of your antibiotic course. But if you stop halfway through, you've killed off the weak bacteria and you're selecting the, the robust bacteria. And that's microevolution in action. And so take your antibiotics, all, all seven pills, <laughs> or whatever it is, if you get a Z-Pack, okay? Because you don't want your body to be an incubator for, a, you know, resistant bacteria. And then here, the macroevolution, if you take these things like mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and natural selection, and add in a long period of time, like 3.8 billion years, that's the age of some of the oldest bacteria that we've discovered on Earth, uh, the, the fossils of, of sulfate reducing bacteria that's very, very old, you get macroevolution. Now that can't be observed because we can't run an experiment for a billion years. Okay? But what they're saying is, and a, a colleague of mine in chemistry, he said, if it works when I see it, then I trust that it works when I don't see it. So they're taking that microevolution and extrapolating. And, and what else can you do? You can't run an experiment for 3.8 billion years. Now, for things that multiply faster, like bacteria, they've got some long experiments, long as in a year or two, but that's thousands upon thousands of generations in the bacterial lifespan. Okay, so they've seen some of these things uh, occur, but again, there's really no way to observe experimentally macroevolution. So then now let's uh, define creation in Scopes Day. So going back to 1925, the, the, the main view at the time, for at least for the Christian fundamentalists who were passing the Butler Act, was that they believed in the specific and special creation of Adam and Eve on the sixth 24-hour day of creation. And they were focused on humans because that was the thing that was really bothersome to them about World War I and so on. In fact, there's some quotes from Brian that say, look, if other species or plants or animals came by uh, some sort of natural process, he wasn't bothered by that. He was specifically focused on the value, inherent worth of humanity. And so this is the passage from Genesis 1. And God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let's have them 
have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over the creeping things that creepeth on the earth. So, and the King James Version would be probably what they were reading. Okay, so what does this tell us? Remember that, that I said, what's the main issue? When did mankind arrive, and are they special? Creationists would have a specific answer to that, and the evolutionists would have a different answer to that. And so that's where the clash is, is over mankind. When did they arrive and are they special? So since the, in the last 95 years, a lot has changed. But let me pause here just to, to take a break and see if there are any questions. Because I've covered a lot. I don't want to sit here and talk to you for the whole time. So has this raised anything in your mind oh, that you want to bring up? And it's all fair game. And we are talking about the elephant in the room, so you can go there. <laughs> okay. And I'll give you at least a minute to think. Yeah. So if you're waiting me out, it's going to be a long wait so somebody can say something. Yes, Joy. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we'll do more questions then as well. Yes. Did this help with uh, putting it in context of World War One? Yeah. So, because sometimes we we isolate our timelines. We think, oh, this is a you know Darwinian evolution debate and Christianity, and it happened in 1925. But we don't think what's happening politically with war. We don't think what's happening with uh, you know other social things, a disease as well. Okay, so let's get on to the 95 years since scopes, what's changed. How has evolutionary biology changed? Oh my goodness. I mean this, again, you could take three or four courses in molecular biology to know because almost all of that has happened since 1925. But DNA is probably the biggest. Uh, not only is it uh, an amazing thing that that we've discovered about DNA, but it also answers that question of how those uh, inheritable traits get passed on from parent to child. Yes. So this is really changed since the trial? Yes. And so after the trial, you know, we had this epic battle and so on. And so I'm just trying to think, okay, what's happened on the on the evolution side and biology and what's happened on the Christianity side? So we'll look at both sides and see what are the new developments in the last ninety five years. And so DNA, not just DNA, but RNA and proteins. So we didn't just learn about DNA. We learned that what DNA does, it's, it replicates itself. And, and it makes RNA, and there's types of RNA. There's, there's messenger RNA that, that makes all the proteins in our bodies. Okay. And then there's non-coding RNA that has some other functions, like regulatory functions. They insert themselves in certain things to turn processes on and off. So when you think about regulating, uh, processes. Think about a light switch. So, you know, instead of me punching the light switch and walking away, it would be a little molecule that goes and inserts into that and makes it possible for the lights to come on. And so then if I were to block that, I could put something in there that doesn't make the lights come on, but it keeps the other thing from getting into the same slot. And so you have regulatory functions that are based upon molecules. And those are uh, all throughout the body. And another amaz amazing thing is that the DNA creates RNA which creates proteins and those proteins are what help DNA create the RNA. And those proteins help RNA create proteins. And so the machinery is making itself. It's a pretty amazing system. Okay, And that hasn't even gotten into the code of DNA. That these, these four bits, if you will, G, C, T, and A, um, are like a language. Bill Gates says it's like a computer language, but Microsoft has never produced anything like it. I mean, it's way more advanced than, than, than anything we've come up with, mainly because it's a, it's a language that creates structures that help reproduce the language. So this would be your hard drive creating the structures to copy the hard drive. Okay, so. And then one way we've learned about these processes was radioactive labeling. This one doesn't get talked about very much, but this was a huge breakthrough uh, and also happened really since 1925. So uh, 
the ability to not only know about radioactive elements, that was happening right at the turn of the century, uh, 18th to 19th centuries, and I'm sorry, 19th to 20th, and, and then they started using radioactive labeling. So if I want to know uh, where uh, sugar goes in the body, I could put in a carbon-14 atom in that sugar, and I could eat it. And then I could take samples of fat and samples of muscle and samples of urine and feces and so on, and I could see where that radioactive element went. And I could time it. I could do kinetics. And so a lot of our meta metabolic uh, rates were determined using radioactive labeling. The Krebs cycle and how we metabolize sugars to get energy and make ATP and those things. Also, radioactive labeling helped us do those things. So you might think of radioactivity and radionuclides as being more of a physics thing, but it, for you know decades, uh, almost a century, it's been a biology thing too. And that's how we know a lot of the biochemical pathways. And then there's also been many more fossils discovered. So you know the. The first human fossil, which was sort of suspect, was 1909, and now we've got so many more fossils that, that look human-like, and, and in fact, the, the, the hominid fossil group is really uh, still an active area of research. It, it's hard to pin down all of the different structures, because really most of the, they can do is use homology. And so if these populations overlap, it's really difficult to know, say, if uh, Australopithecus was a, a distinct species from this one that looks very similar. You know, so measuring bone length, bone diameters, and all of these properties of the bones. And then we have phylogenetic trees. We have the homology trees that we built, and now we're checking those with software-generated DNA trees. And that's an active area of research. It's so difficult to get those to line up. And so you, if you're ever talking to a biologist, you could ask them what they know about you. have tons of material to talk about in getting the homology tree and the DNA tree to line up. It's a very active area of research. Now after World War I and II, remember the, there was eugenics associated with Darwinian biology, if you will. There were a lot of philosophical ramifications. And so there's been less emphasis in the last 95 years on eugenics although we still do some eugenic-like things with amniocentesis screening. So we'll look to see if a child has Down syndrome or something, and then you'll see people advise the parents to have an abortion. So that's eugenics. Um, Iceland recently said they had eradicated Down syndrome in their country, but what they had done is they just had pretty much gotten 100% buy-in to using amniocentesis to remove Down syndrome babies. So they didn't solve the disease, they've gone a eugenics route. So it's still here, that's eugenics. Okay. Um, and then there's still an, an active interest in transhumanism. And maybe you've never heard that, but think about the, the idea of evolution and now that humans are self-aware, you know, we're not so sure that all the other animals are self-aware, but we're self-aware and we know about evolution, so now we can direct our own evolution. That's kind of what eugenics was about, directing our evolution by sterilization and ch choosing mates for people and so on, and refusing to allow certain groups to marry each other. Okay, that was directed evolution. Now transhumanism is gene editing and, and you know, moving in those directions for human enhancement. So I got a really new book that's come out, it's fantastic, uh, called Humans 2.0. And so if you want information about that, just let me know. Um, so there's still uh, some active role in directed evolution, but it would be more of an individualistic um, focus, uh, not a top-down effect, but more of a, an individual um, driven activity. So now Christianity since scopes. Uh, there's been a lot more archaeology. Uh, if you think about 1925, uh, there, was, there was no state of Israel, there was no all of those biblical places were, were um, let's see, after World War I, it was the British Mandate, so Britain was in charge of the area we call Palestine or Israel. 
Um, and they started, just started some archaeological expeditions. So they started digging in Israel to kind of look for some of these biblical places. What were some of the things that the higher critics and the Christian modernists said just before this time period? They're like, well, the Bible talks about Pontius Pilate. Never heard of him. Okay, the Bible talks about the Decapolis. Never heard of those cities. Ten Greek cities. Uh, the Bible talks about Caesarea. Never found it. So, they, you know, they're pointing out all of these things that the Bible talks about, and they're saying that these places don't exist and these people don't exist. Well, since then, we found inscription stones with Pontius Pilate's name on it, inscription stones with David, King David on it. We found Caesarea. We found the Decapolis. We found a lot of these places that are in the Bible. And so, again, that's a, a development in Christianity in the last 95 years that has really lent a lot of support to those believers for the truthfulness of the scriptures. The Dead Sea Scrolls are an amazing independent find. Yes, it's archaeology, but this is really based on the text of the Bible. Okay? And so in the 50s, they discovered this storehouse, essentially these caves near the Dead Sea. Uh, um, a, a shepherd was roaming around, and one of his sheep went in a cave, and he threw a rock up there to get it to run out, and he heard pottery break. And that's how he discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. And so then what they were were these pottery containers and these scrolls, copies of the Old Testament, were, were preserved in these um, clay pots for thousands of years. <laughs> you know, and so it's pretty amazing. One thing that's amazing about it is that uh, it has some of the oldest copies of Isaiah and Daniel and essentially all of the books of the Old Testament. Uh, what's important about that for Daniel was uh, Daniel was an amazing book and the scholars, the higher critics, said it could not be written that old, like in the Babylonian time period, because it accurately predicted the rise of uh, Cyrus the Great, King of Persia, uh, Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, and the fall of the Roman Empire. So it was so, and, and the scholars were saying, this is so accurate in talking about the next several kingdoms after the, uh, after the Jewish time frame. Uh, that it had to be written late and inserted as a prophecy, right? Because a Christian modernist may not believe in prophecy. And so they're going to say, how do, we, how do we get our minds around this strange, looks like prophecy in Daniel, is, except to say that it was written late and inserted as if it was original, okay? And, but they didn't have any old copies of Daniel. And sure enough, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had an old copy of Daniel, and it was in the original. Okay. It, was, it was recorded before those kingdoms changed hands, before the events happened. So that one is something you could chew on because that's an amazing uh, find. Now, Christianity since Scopes has become, I think, maybe a more divided house. There are more modernists. There are, are more, fundamentals, more fundamentalists. There are more folks in the middle. And so we've got a larger variety within Christianity of beliefs. Uh, we don't have as much of a top-down structure as we had back in the past with, um, uh, you know, there's more denominations and more non-denominational groups and so on. So there's just more diversity in the, in the Christian umbrella. Um, and yet there's a small, even though they're smaller, maybe a more vocal group that still advocates for the teaching of models of creation alongside evolution in schools. And so when I said, here's a short list of legal cases, these are the battles that are still going on, okay, with this smaller group of Christian fundamentalists. And when I use the word Christian fundamentalist, there's a negative connotation to that, okay? That's, I'm not using that as a as I'm calling them names, right? I'm using it as a real technical term. They have certain fundamentals that define the Christian faith and they believe in those, okay? So I'm, you know, when you hear that, sometimes you may hear it with a negative connotation, but it's just saying, no, there are certain fundamentals for this group, and that's what they believe. Okay. Now, liberal theology uh, from the 1860s continues. And so we still have churches that really deny miracles and deny anything in the supernatural. Okay. Um, and fundamentalist theology continues as well. So still having arguments about what are the fundamentals and how do we word our belief statements and so on. So these are active discussions. So those things may not have changed since the 20s, but they're ongoing, and they will continue to go. Okay. 
Now here's an interesting thing though. There are several new views on Genesis. So when I talked about here's what the fundamentalists believe in 1925 and this is what the war was over, uh, now there seems to be four major camps on interpreting Genesis. So let's look at those. So how has biblical interpretation changed? Here are four views on Genesis 1 and 2. And if you, uh, maybe I should put that in the reading as well. Uh, but you know, you, you can find a Bible online and read the first two chapters of the book. It's easy to find, <laughs> okay? And, and you can see it's the creation story and it goes through and then you can look at these four views and compare them to this uh, creation story that you see in Genesis 1 and 2. The first one is the one of William Jennings Bryan and the Christian fundamentalists uh, that the universe, earth, and all living things were created in six 24-hour days about 6,000 years ago. Okay, so that's what we would call the 24-hour day view. A lot of times they like to, uh, I would say, mentally stack the deck and call that the literal view. Okay, but I think that's claiming too much because you can still interpret day as a long unspecified period of time and still be treating the text as literal. Like if I say in the it, back in the day, you know, I'm not talking about a specific day. Back in my day, I'm talking about my high school days or something like that, it's a, it's a period of non-specific duration. And yet you're still taking the meaning of that person literally. Okay? So the day-age view is what I'm talking about. The universe in this view was created 13.8 billion years ago, which is our latest data from science. Uh, the earth was about 4.54 billion years ago, and the days of Genesis are long periods of development that align with what we see in the geological record. And so for this person, you might have the development of uh, plant life, and you don't see any animals for a while, and then all of a sudden there's a new intervention, and there's a discontinuity, and now you have animal life. And that would demark a day. So the day would be this period of a very little activity and then a creation event that sets apart the next day. And so you would have these long periods of, of stasis and you would see this abrupt change. And the reason that the folks that adhere to this view is they see that this aligns with what we see in Genesis. You see a growth in complexity from creation of the world and the oceans and so on. And so you see the early development of the earth becoming hospitable to life and that would be day one. Then you see volcanic activity, land emerging, be day two, okay, and those kinds of things. And then you have plant life showing up, we're at day four, you know. Then animal life showing up, and, and day, or like fish, day four, and then animals, day five, and, and six, humanity. I kind of messed that up, but you get the idea that it goes from more simple to complex, and it's discontinuous. So it's, you've got activity and then a burst of newness and then a, then a stasis. So that's the day-age view. Then you have the framework view which looks at Genesis a little more uh, allegorically or, or uh, it's using Genesis not as a, a science book or a how to create a universe book but as putting it in context with Moses' time. So with Moses as the author We've got the Jewish exiles leaving Egypt and wandering in the wilderness, and Moses is teaching them who their God is. It's not the gods of the Egyptians. Okay. And so these days are, are teaching tools against the Egyptian gods. So if the Egyptians worship the sun as a god, Moses is telling them, no, God created the sun, God created the moon, God created the oceans and the land. And so these are not gods to be worshipped, these are creatures. Okay. And so then that's another way, again, a, a theological development from, from the 20, 1925 to the present is more of a development of these different kinds of views. And then the analy analogical view is similar. Uh, it wouldn't focus so much on a teaching tool against the Egyptian gods, but just what does it mean to the, the Christian or the ancient Jew to have uh, the earth and the sun and the plants and the animals be creatures of God. And so uh, looking at the work week as sort of this periodic cycle that we see in nature and so on. So there's, there's a lot of different views of Genesis, not just the young earth view. And that's been a 
a major development in the past 95 years. Okay. So remember the difficulty, uh, because all of the stuff I've said so far, uh, depending upon who hears it, is like nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> okay. Uh, if I'm talking to someone who's an anti-supernaturalist and I keep using the word God created, they're like bristling, you know. Or if I have someone who's a young earth creationist and I'm talking about the day being a long period of unspecified length, they, they tense up. Okay. And so once again, we have this issue. If, if their view in their mind is prescribed by divine law, they have a difficult time in their conscience even entertaining an alternate view. And it put the, you know, the other words, non-religious and materialism too, if they're anti-supernatural, they again would have a difficult time entertaining the truthfulness of any of these other views. And so if you feel tense because your view is not, you know, the one being promoted, that's okay. That's natural. You're going to feel some tension when you hear other views and you just um, relax and, and try to understand. Remember, move the goal from winning to understanding. So let's try to get in the mind of these different views. And I think this is a, a, a thing that I can offer this debate. Not only am I a scientist and can talk about the strengths and weaknesses of biological evolution, but I'm also a Christian and I can talk about the different mindsets of the people who I've talked with that have these different views. I'm intentionally not trying to tell you my view. I'm trying to give you the different takes on these different views. Okay, so that you're not influenced to accept my view just because I'm a professor or a friendly or whatever. I don't want to win you over to that. I'm just trying to inform you on the different views. So let's get inside the mind of a young earth creationist. Why would they believe these things and this is their motivation? So someone who believes in a 6,000 year old universe has a trust in the Bible as God's word. And it's an unshakable trust in the Bible as God's Word. They also trust in the complete genealogical record that's in that Bible from Jesus to Adam. And you can find this in many places. You can find it in Genesis and Exodus. You can find it in Luke. You can find it in all different places where this person's son was this person who gave birth to that person, and they just go through. And you can take this, this genealogy, and it gives the lifespans of many of them, not every one of them, and you can add it up and it gets to you roughly 6,000 years. Okay. So, it's, I mean, for this person, it's the Bible is the Word of God. God's the only witness of these events. He told Moses what to write down. Airtight. We've got every generation from Adam to David, and from, or Adam from Noah to Noah to David, David to Jesus. We've got it all. Okay. And so there's, there's really no controversy there in their mind, okay? And so this is, uh, this is really tough for them to consider an alternate view because it's right there in the Bible, and the Bible's the Word of God, okay? And a theological in interpretation that absolutely, this is another thing that is really critical. Um, if you were to say, yeah, but evolution could have happened prior to that 6,000 years, then they, they also have a problem with that. Because what does the Bible say? That, that humanity was created on day six, and there was a day of rest, and then an unspecified time later, Adam and Eve were given one job. <laughs> Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What happened? They ate. Now, we always say an apple. It doesn't say what kind of fruit it was, but, you know, they ate. And the temptation was, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And guess what? That came true. They knew good from evil because they knew that what they had done was evil. So they now knew the difference between good and evil, and they were on the evil side. And because of that, death came into the world. So that's what the Bible says in Genesis. And so if that was the beginning of death, then absolutely no death could have occurred before the fall. So how are you going to have eons of evolution where this species grows and that species grows and this, the ancient apes die out and then along comes newer apes and mankind and so on. So millions and millions of years of animal death is impossible on this view because death did not happen until the fall. So there's, there's nothing to debate, right? So this is inside the mind 
of someone who has this view. Okay. And so this is where the 6,000 years comes from, is that gene genealogical record. And this is why evolution just cannot be believed. Because it would require death before the fall. Okay. All right. Any questions on this view? This is an opp opportune time. If you don't want to get into a discussion with if a person that believes this, or if you don't know them, you can ask me, and I'll, you know, I'll answer from their perspective. Okay? So now's your chance. And don't be bashful. Y'all are bashful. Yeah, go for it. Doesn't the Bible say something about a day um, in God's time being different than a day in like regular time for us? Yes, and, and I forget if it's first or second Peter, but he talks about a day being like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Yeah. And so when I said there's no discussion, there is discussion to be had, but I'm trying to present a view of, of a person who's just not open for discussion on that. So they would they would say, Well that's not what that means, you know, perhaps that's what they would say. You know. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what we'll do next. Yeah. Yes, Joy. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Let me talk to you about some of the research that's been done on behalf of this view. There's a group called the Institute Institute for Creation Research, okay? And these are scientists that <coughs> have PhDs in biology and chemistry and geology and so on. And so they will do research that supports these views to show that the earth and the universe are young. Um, and so they will look at maybe the radioactive decay rates have changed in the past. Okay, and so that our whole idea of radioactive dating is off, and so that the the geologic, oh, uh, the fossil record is just misleading because it's really not that old. Uh, they'll say the fossil record came from the flood, and so there's this global flood event. You've heard of the flood of Noah, and that all of the strata and all of the fossils and everything came from the flood of Noah. So the flood of Noah carries a lot of a weight in this view as giving us this this view of our Earth as being old. Okay. Uh, astronomy is an issue for that because of the flight time or, or you know the vastness of the universe and so there's a real difficulty with this view on the vastness of the universe and so they'll get into physics and talk about maybe changes in physics in the past and so on so we'll we there are there are scientists on both sides debating this view from a scientific point of view and there's it's endless reading so if you like that uh, sort of reading those different science uh, debates then then it's uh, it's a fertile ground yeah so hopefully I wasn't too one-sided on that I try to show that there's problems with it and there's also some supports for it too yes oh yes they would say that it was written by Moses but uh, but um, all of the folks who believe in the biblical inerrancy, meaning that the Bible is without error and, and is truthful in all of its claims, and, uh, would say that even though God didn't dictate the words Moses used, the Spirit inspired Moses to write the truth. Okay? So Moses, what Moses is writing is true, is what they'd say. Okay? And that God was the only one there. Moses didn't watch this happen. Okay? So God is the one that is informing Moses what to write down, okay? But because God's giving Moses the inspiration, it's by definition true. Now, uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't need to be interpreted. It's written in Hebrew, and Hebrew has a small lexicon. We have many more words in English than, than Hebrew had, especially at the time. And so they have one word, yom, for day. But yom could also be used, and even in Genesis is used for 24-hour day, for the daylight hours, which is 12 hours, uh, for the non-specified time, like in the day when God created the heavens and the earth. 
You know, in the previous chapter it says it took seven days. But then in the next chapter it says, in the day we created the heavens and earth. So there again, yom, the same word is used for a non-specified period of time. So again, it requires interpretation. And so that's where the battle is between the, the different views. And so we have the young earth view, and then the next one we'll look at is the day age view. And they get into the Hebrew, and they go head to head on what yom means and what create means and so on. Yeah. So now let's go to an old earth creation view. That would be the day age view. I don't want to run out of time because I could go long on this. Okay. Are we out of time? Oh my gosh. Let me just, I know we're out of time, but this one uh, is also called Concordism. And remember I said the two books idea, book of nature and book of scripture. That's really the roots of this one. They're saying the book of nature is reliable because God wrote that too. And the book of scripture is reliable because God wrote that. And so this is really looking at whatever we see in science that, that we can see and see it lines up with the Bible. We're interpreting both correctly because they're in concord with each other. And when one or the other conflicts, then that's the exciting time of looking at your interpretation of scripture or your interpretation of the nature. And so this view is really open to seeking the truth wherever it's located. Um, I mean, I don't want to say that sounds like I'm casting, you know, negative light on other views. But, but, uh, but this one is, again, not, a, not afraid of the latest advancements in astronomy or biology or physics or chemistry. Um, but yet they also look at the book of Scripture. And whenever there's a conflict, if there really is a true tie, then Scripture would break the tie. But most of the time they can see maybe this is interpreted incorrectly here. Or maybe this scientific finding isn't exactly correct and we're confused by it. And maybe it'll be decades before we figure that one out. But we can at least identify these areas where they don't quite line up. And so that'd be the day age view. Okay. And we could go along with this and, and we can bring it back up too at the end of the course. Okay. So uh, we're out of time. I'm sorry. So that was a great day. So thanks.